I can get the outside where it's in, in good shape again. Okay. Well, applies, like you know, as far as eyesore or something like that there, I, mean, I do got medical condition, but I will try to get some people to help me. Is it possible, I'll ask this to the inspector. Yes, sir. Is it possible to rehabilitate that house? It is. Sir. Yes, sir. That was a gym water home to start with, and I, I had a house that uh, moved over there, built in 1925, and backed up to it. And I, I put two houses together and stuff and built it like it was. At one time, I had it looking good enough that uh, Ford Properties wanted to put it in showcase for realtors. I used to paint for them. But, uh, I fell off a roof, and I haven't been able to work. Well, if you think you can get it cleaned up in 30 days, we're going to give you 30 days to get it cleaned up. Yes, sir. But now, if it doesn't, we're going to demolish it. And then it's going to be a lien put on the property, and you'll have to pay. You won't have the house anymore. Yes, you understand that? I, I already went through that. I had one next door when I fell off of the roof, and, the, okay. and the, they did that to that one because I couldn't get the wiring brought up today. Okay. So I do understand what you're saying. Sir, the first, the first thing you need to do is secure it, and don't let anybody loiter around there. We, I, don't want, I don't want that to be a nuisance for our sheriff's department to have to clean up yes, sir. day after day. Well, the whole uh, area there is something that my father had put most of the houses there. We all had, moved, had houses moved over there and put together the whole the little place right there behind the post office. But, uh, but yeah. you, mu you must secure the property, and you know yes, if sir. you intend to live there, then you, you've got 30 days to show us some progress on that. So it's or been it's a commission family home. I would like to try to keep it in the family and, and hand it down to my son. My okay. Son. okay. I got a question. Thank you, Pastor. What if during that period of 30 days, the sheriff's department back out there and they make some arrests off that property there's no one believing there or anything sir uh, i mean i got arrested for going over there myself twice first night i got out of jail i went in there to get clothes but i lost my keys and i got arrested that night the next time i thought somebody was over in my house and i parked on the lot next door and i got arrested again but i wasn't on that property but i couldn't convince them that it wasn't two lot you know that there were separate lots Mr. Evans. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is for the officer. Um, help me understand, where is Charles Street? Charles Street. And I know, Mr. Evans, you've been here a while, and all of y'all have to, so this, I'm going to give you a visual side of it, okay? Mount Rose Motel, McKenna Street, that dirt road going alongside McKenna Street in between what used to be the mobile home place you saw, Carolina mobile home and all that there. You go down that dirt road, you take the left on Cooper, Take a left on Cooper Street. Not Cooper Street, I'm sorry. Moody Street. Take a left on Moody Street. Go all the way down to the stop sign. Take a right, and you'll be coming in behind the um, post office on um, Holy Drive. Or the parts houses or Glenn's truck stop and all that there. It falls right in that area right in there. It's back there. It's kind of like an isolated area. And um, that's where it's at. And, and if, and if you don't quite got a picture, I'll even try to help you a little bit more on it. Okay. I'm glad to. Um, and thank you for that. I have an idea where you're at now. Um, I, you prostitutes and stuff. I had never known until I let this one guy move in with me. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I was speaking with the sheriff's deputy right quick. Um, sorry, let me ask you. In that particular area, is it um, – a haven for prostitution and drugs. Is it an yeah. area that you've yeah. been trying to clean up for a long period of time? Because yes, I know sir. Route, Mount Rose is a place where, well, I shouldn't say that, but. Yes, sir. It, it, we've been working it for a while, yes, sir. And, and so that you, general area is known for it because even over there, and it's just right around the corner from El Rancho, which, you know, it's burnt down. The girls even had a place in the bamboo shoots where they had uh, condoms on the thing and chairs and black, and they were doing curbside service there. Oh. And we got <coughs> them there, and I had to haul all that stuff to the landfill okay. um, to get get rid of it. We've been in. Uh, at one time, the girls were getting so bold. Not far from that house, they even jumped into a, a, a van, trying to solicit business when their business got down. It's not hard to see them when. Um, you know, we've been we've been running little prostitution rings and everything else, and it's it's a slow progress, but we are making progress. And one more quick question. I'm sorry, Mr. Chevy. Just one more quick question. Um, the businesses and individuals that stay around that particular area. Yes, sir. 
Have you received a number of complaints from them about the illicit activity going on and, and all kinds of issues that's dealing with the prostitution and the drugs and all of this? Yes, 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 sir, we sure have. We've also, and I wouldn't want to sit here and name the, the individuals, but. Uh, no, I wouldn't want you to. Um, but um, you even have some of the, um, that house's backyard butts up to, to some, to some big businesses that we got here in Cumberland County. When I say big, like record services and water services and so on, storage buildings and stuff. And we've even heard complaints out of them. Okay. Okay. It, and, um, uh, and, and, and I would dare to, uh, to say this to help you out a little bit. You know, anytime y'all, you could, um, it's not as bad as it was, but certain times of the evening, say around 4.30 and between 4.30 and 7, if you used to go around that area, you could see some of our girls in around 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, it's, um, we have, and I know it sounds a little bit, but see, you got to catch them doing the, they got to ask for the services and all that. You know, there's certain things that the law has in place that we got to have in place in order to win it in court. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman, just one more question, please. Um, young man that owns the um, building and I'm not trying to get into your business but this will help me um, and I'm sure it might help others as well when you say that you have that you've been running into problems what type of problems have you been running into uh, I'm in my health okay okay I've got a hernia right now so okay. I tried to get it removed but uh, I do okay that's that's fine me. that's fine okay uh, yeah, I did go to the emergency room and try to get that out. But I am disabled also. I've got pins in my knees and my ankles up and uh, two hip replacements. Okay. Thank so you, sir. I've got, I've got two grown boys and, and, you know, and stuff. Some people that's volunteered to try to help me get the yard cleaned up. I understand. Thank you. <clears throat> or like he said, with activity, there's a path over there beside that storage company that they cut through to go to that, the motels over on 95 over there off of West Mountain. Like I said, they use it for a lot to go through to the store. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the order of the minimum housing inspector as the true facts in this case and to order the property owner to remove or demolish the dwelling within 30 days. To order the inspector to remove or demolish the dwelling if the owner fails to do so mm -hmm. and impose a lien on the real property for the cost of such action and to direct the clerk to incorporate the foregoing findings and orders in an ordinance certified by the chairman and record the same in the register of deeds. Second. second. Okay, it's moved and second. Let me let me understand what are you are you are you, are you not are you giving him thirty days? I'm giving him thirty days. To 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 knock it down. No, give him thirty days to or to to clean it up or, or they're going we're gonna knock it down. Is that what the motion says? Okay. Mm. Well I withdraw by second. Read the motion again. I didn't hear. I didn't hear you give him 30 days. I move that we adopt the order and report of the minimum housing inspector as the true facts in this case, and order the property owner to remove or demolish the dwelling within 30 days. To order the inspector to remove or demolish the dwelling if the owner fails to do so, and impose a lien on the real property for the cost of such action, and to direct the clerk to incorporate the foregoing findings and orders in an ordinance certified by the chairman and record the same in the register of deeds. Okay, I'll, I'll second. I'm sorry you have my hearing aid on. I'm sorry. I'll second. Okay, all right. It's moved and seconded. All right, is there discussion? I call for the end of discussion. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Voting in favor, Commissioners Edge, Adams, Council, and Evans voting in opposition, Chairman Faircloth and Commissioner Lancaster. Okay, okay next item. Yes, sir. Next. Our next public hearing is on the proposed 2017 schedules, standards, and rules for the 2017 property tax revaluation. I ask our tax administrator, Mr. Utley, to come forth, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Commissioners. Good evening. 
The schedule of values was presented to the Board of Commissioners and made available to the public on November 7th at the Commissioner's meeting. On Tuesday, November the 8th, an ad was placed in the Bevel Observer providing notica notification that the schedule of values was available for public inspection in the Tax Administrator's Office. In the same ad, notification made known that a public hearing concerning the schedule of values would be held at the regularly scheduled Commissioner's meeting on November the 21st, 2016. And that's what uh, we're here for tonight is the public hearing. Okay, this time I'll open the public hearing. Are there any speakers on this There one? are no speakers. No speakers, okay. All right, I'll ask the board. Uh, we just take that under advisement. We don't have any action on that, right? Yes, okay. sir. The, um, we, we have to, to wait 30 days oh. before the board can um, actually approve the schedule of values. Okay. So we'll bring that back at our December 19th meeting. Okay. All right. Close the public here. Where we go next? Our next public hearing is on the approval okay. of submission of, is a public hearing and an approval of submission of the 2018 North Carolina Department of Transportation grant application for the Community Transportation Program. I'll ask Mr. Strickland to come forward and give us some background information, please, before the public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Cannon and commissioners. Um, this is our yearly administrative grant for the community transportation program. We renew it every year, um, and DOT is getting more and more aggressive with renewing it early. Um, so we're, we're actually approving fiscal year 2018 um, at this point. Um, so this will be, right now we're looking at the same amount of funding as last year, which was $132,078, um, which means the county's local match for that would be $19,812. That's no change at the moment. There is some talk that DOT may actually uh, add some additional funds to the program depending upon how expenditures go this year. But at this point, um, the number we're bringing to you is the 132078, and uh, the local match would be $19,812. Um, just to refresh you a little bit on this, uh, Again, that was the total that we had this fiscal year as well. Previous to that, our total was around $60,000. Um, and the county had to come up with whatever additional funding was needed for salaries or for uh, office supplies or computer hardware or whatever was needed for the program. So the increase from NCDOT has been <clears throat> extremely valuable for the program and for the county. Um, so again, we're just asking for approval to submit the application for the $132,078 with the county's share of that being 19812 And if, um, if we do get a, a, a new number from NCDOT in the future, we'll bring that back to you. Okay. First Any questions need, this time? First, we'll need to open the public yeah, hearing. We'll open the public hearing. Any speakers? No, there are no speakers. No speakers this time. Council? Okay. I move that we approve the submission of the Fiscal year 2018 Community Transportation Program grant application to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. I hope they give us a little bit more money. <laughs> the <laughs> November, um, that's my motion. Okay. Sorry. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Our first item of business is consideration of a request from Grays Creek Properties, LLC, for removal of graves to a private cemetery pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 65-106. And I would ask the county attorney, Mr. Moorfield, to give us some background information on this, please. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Local attorney Charles Gardner came to the county with this. Uh, it's. Uh, a statute that authorizes a lot of entities, including private individuals, in this case a private company, a limited liability company, to remove private uh, cemeteries or, or, or burials from private property to an appropriate cemetery. Uh, Mr. Gardner, and I've attached all that information in the, pa in the package, I, I believe that he uh, fully uh, complied with the statutory requirements in, in 
exercising due diligence by hiring a professional genealogist to uh, uh, see if she could determine who the potential uh, next of kin to one of the persons who was buried there in 1887 and that she did identify 15 persons who, who would, would possibly be uh, next of kin to that decedent in Cumberland or Robinson County, I think there's some of our state. But uh, they have given notice by certified mail to all of those persons, have attached the order confirmation with a faithful observer in which he advertised the company's intent to uh, do this process as approved by the Board of Commissioners. There are three graves there. Uh, one of the unusual aspects of this is that uh, after the person was buried in 1887, the next person was uh, uh, the mother of some of the heirs of, that, that are involved in this, uh, who was buried in 1999. When their father died in 2007, they, uh, they had already sold this property to, to this LLC and they approached the new owner and asked if their father could be buried there. They actually uh, wrote up a contract in which the heirs agreed that if they would allow their father to be buried there beside their mother in the future, if the company had a need to move those graves, they would consent to it. And so that's a copy of that's in there also. So we're talking about three graves. The uh, Mr. Garden reports that the company has located a, a private cemetery uh, to move these uh, graves to. I've spoken with the health director, and the health director has agreed that either he or he'll designate someone from the health department to uh, direct and supervise this process. And that's that's a, another statutory requirement. And if the board uh, sees fit to to approve this request, uh, I recommend it, and it prepared just if the uh, the board can approve this request of the property owner, subject to the property owner coordinating with the health director or is designated to direct and supervise the process, uh, complying with the requirements of, of the statute for filing a written certificate with the register of deeds, uh, removing, replacing, or protecting and replacing all the tombstones or markers, and being responsible for all costs associated with this process. Okay, board, any questions for the, uh, not, oh. Mr. Council? That's my motion as the attorney just stated. I okay. second that. Moved and seconded. Any discussion at this time? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Item six. Item number six is consideration of disaster debris removal and monitoring service contracts. And our assistant county manager, Mr. Jackson, is going to present this item. As he makes his way to the podium, I believe the clerk placed a revised item number six, a paper copy, um, at your seat. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, before I start, if I may, I'd like to uh, introduce somebody to you. We have uh, our <coughs> new disaster recovery consultant from IEM with us tonight, and her name is Teresa Carter. She's here in the audience with us. So I just want to uh, introduce you to her. And um, I'll start by saying that um, we have received a number of um, proposals for debris management and removal and um, our review panel consisted of myself, Randy Beeman, our Director of Emergency Services, uh, Jeffrey Brown, our Director of Engineering and Infrastructure, and Gene Booth, our Emergency Management Coordinator. Um, we reviewed these proposals in there. Um, as uh, Ms. Cannon said, you had this um, new and most recent memo, and I'll go through that with you right now. Uh, and explain where we're at with the, uh, the proposals and our recommendations. As you know, uh, due to the flooding associated with Hurricane Matthew and the catastrophic damage that resulted, our county uh, was left with res uh, soliciting two separate requests for proposals for debris management. And uh, the first one, um, number 1712 ES, was for management and monitoring. The second, number 17-13 ES, was for clearance and removal. In order to be eligible for federal disaster reimbursement and to assure that adequate project oversight and accountability occurs, uh, the county had to seek separate contractors in each of uh, those categories. We received responses to uh, each of the RFP. We actually had uh, eight different companies, uh, that's four per category, that responded. And the results of the, the, uh, the process are shown there below. 
In terms of the disaster uh, debris management and recovery companies, uh, landfall strategies came in with the highest score. In terms of the evaluation criteria that we use there, um, we look for companies uh, that had substantial experience, not just in one state, but multiple states with multiple disasters, large scale disasters. So we did not want any fly by night companies. We were strictly looking for the most experienced and the most professional companies that we could in order to uh, perform this work. So we looked at their monitoring experience, um, their emergency management experience, actually dealing with the folks at FEMA and the state emergency management, their staff's experience, their background, um, where they had worked previously, um, what they brought to the table, um, the planning timetable, how quickly they can respond and be on scene in our county to help us with the assessment and uh, planning process. Uh, their training program, which is very important and mandated by uh, various state and federal requirements. And of course, uh, the reasonableness of their fees. Uh, the second RFP for debris clearance removal, um, Ceres Environmental came in as the top scoring company. And the criteria that we use there, again, uh, somewhat similar, but a little bit different because this, this company deals with the, the hands-on labor, the actual pickup of the debris out in the field, where the first company is monitoring what the, the debris removal company is doing, just to make sure that we're keeping them honest. Uh, we looked at strictly their qualifications, how long they've been doing it, how much they've done across the country, um, their technical experience, their financial strength, how quickly they can get here on scene, and also uh, their schedule of fees for performing the services. Um, now, Ms. Carter that you were induced, introduced to just a few minutes ago, um, she arrived on scene to help us uh, November the 15th. And uh, under her advice, we also uh, sought some additional information from the companies that were the, the top scoring in the RFP process. And we also looked at um, the active number of projects that they're dealing with across the states because there were multiple states involved, of course, with this disaster. And um, also their tonnage costs for picking up debris uh, because originally we had thought there'd be a lot of vegetated debris. What we found, uh, at least staff has found in the assessment, is that most of what's out there is construction and demolition related debris, very little um, vegetative which means um, we're dealing mainly with tonnage rates and not cubic, cubic yard type measurements, uh, which would be more often applied to, to vegetative debris. So we've sought a uh, budget revision in the amount of $600,000, uh, and that has been created. And um, in order to uh, enter into some contracts for this service, um, there's a not to exceed amount for $300 per <coughs> contract, so two separate contracts. Again, one for monitoring and one for the actual debris pickup. Um, all the hurricane-related work is to be completed no later than January 7th of 2017, unless uh, extended by the Board of Commissioners. We feel like that's a, a very reasonable time frame, and, uh, and we're very hopeful that it can be done in uh, a shorter amount of time. Tracy, can I make one clarification? The contracts are three hundred thousand dollars each. Right, right. A total of six hundred thousand, but two separate contracts, three hundred thousand apiece. Um, at this point, our recommendation: uh, staff recommends the board of commissioners approve the attached resolution authorizing the county manager to enter into contracts for debris management and recovery, and debris clearance and removal, plus approve the budget revision B one seven zero five seven eight for 600000 to cover the cost of the forthcoming contracts with Landfall Strategies and Series Environmental. And uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Mr. Adams. <clears throat> I, I, I do have a question, and I guess make sure I understand this. There are two contracts. Two separate contracts. One is to pick up the debris, the hands-on pick it up. Yes, sir. And the other one is to monitor the one that's picking up. You have to have somebody to watch I, the one that's picking I, up. I got yes, it. So I'm going to pay somebody $300,000 even though I got somebody who's hand picking up, I'm paying them the exact same amount. It doesn't seem to me that I should have to pay somebody the same amount to monitor somebody who's actually doing 
the legwork. If I, uh, I just under, don't understand, understand the, the what value you're of it. The value right. doesn't. The values don't come out to me. Is that if I'm gonna ride around in the truck to make sure you're picking it up, and I don't know what all they're doing, I'm gonna pay you the same amount as the man who's out there picking it up and disposing of it. I mean, I, so it's the first contract. It just seems a little bit high to me at three hundred thousand. Right, and I can explain that. Okay. Yes. So it's an up to amount, not to exceed amount. Mm -hmm. So we we don't anticipate it's going to go above that amount. Now the monitoring company has different rates and different fees than the uh, the pickup company. We'll just should be lower. Well, and they have their own experts and their own people. So there's a, a schedule of people with different titles and different jobs, different functions, and a lot of these functions are FEMA mandated. Okay. So there is a requirement that there be a separate company that do the I, monitoring. I got that part. Okay. And their rates are what they are. And we've looked at those across the board, uh, compared those to the other companies. Now, it's not just based on a low bid. It's based on all the other qualifications in our procurement process, too. So we're able to pick the most qualified person. And, and What's the ranges, them? then, I guess, for the for the for the for the the first one that, that does the monitor what, what kind of range do we have up uh, if you if you don't have that I, I understand but I mean well I have I have it okay but it's uh, and I know when you looked at them you, you took in the tonnage where they were working and all of that but I'd like to see the range from whatever up to three hundred thousand right. dollars because I just think that, that and, and, I, and we can get you that information we're in the process of trying to work out contracts and finalize some some details so um, that's something that we can do um, in terms of getting you some more information. I can say that um, in, in terms of explaining the cost, for example, um, for the debris management and recovery, four different vendors, Landfall Strategies. This is the first one. Of the, this is the first one. You're right. This is the first one, Landfall Strategies. For example, um, there are a number of different positions listed in their RFP that perform different functions in terms of the monitoring. So there's a project manager. manager. Um, the project manager's cost um, per hour is $62 an hour. The next vendor was $72 an hour. O'Brien's was $68 an hour. Metric was 90. So in, in terms of the cost, and it falls out from there, I mean, and it varies by title, by function. Um, if you look at the hourly cost for all the different positions and and come down to a total or you know at least a column total um, they still were number one in terms of the the cost but there's lots of other functions that we're looking at and lots of other performance issues and qualifications that we're looking at so it's again not just based on price um, we want somebody that's reputable we want somebody that's going to get in there and do the job right make sure that the and this is a very important part make sure that the debris removal is done correctly. And this all comes back to the county getting its reimbursement from the state and federal government at the end of the day and making sure that the debris is removed and handled appropriately. Ms. My second, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was gonna make a suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was wondering if maybe our FEMA consultant who has a significant background and expertise in um, debris management may be able to tell us if that um, normally the monitoring contract, um, if, if these rates are in line with other monitoring contracts that she's had experience with. I don't. Okay. I just want. I just had that question just sure. because, and it's up to three hundred thousand. So I, I trust staff to be able to do the contract. Mm -hmm. I just want to know the difference as to why one was three and both of them were three, and one seemed to be doing a little bit more work. But I trust staff because it's up to okay. three hundred thousand. So I just wanted to make sure in terms of what we were looking at, and he gave me that. I guess my second question is, when they uh, do the removal, um, where are they going to dispose of the debris? It goes to our landfill. landfill. Huh? It goes to the Cumberland County landfill. All right. So, um, is there? Do we charge them, or is that? Are they charging us in the contract? Where does that work out? They charge us, but it's figured into the cost, and that's on a different. Right. So, so when they take it to the landfill, we charge them. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. There's no waiver of fee on that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? 
The only question I have, Tracy, is, uh, and I think you answered it, but uh, FEMA will be looking over our shoulder on this contract, and everything will be and, in and line with everything so that yes, we can get it. That's where I feel fortunate to have uh, Mrs. Carter's expertise. Right. We also have staff in-house that are handling the documentation, and they'll be working closely with the contractors to make sure that everything is done by FEMA standards. And then they, in turn, will also be working with the state and federal.